Welcome, everyone, uh, to the third and last day of the fourth annual conference of the Strategic Studies Unit. Um, urban f warfare is an ancient phenomenon, but over time, war and battlegrounds have shifted from the open field to the cities. And we have seen how the most intense battles took place inside the cities in Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, and Chechnya. Uh, from this perspective, the urban warfare that has been taking place in Ukraine is no exception. However, uh, it does have its distinctive character. To help us take a close look at one year of urban battles in, in Ukraine from Kiev to Bakhmut, we are very fortunate to have with us Professor King, a top expert in the field. We will have it via Zoom, of course. Professor King uh, is the Chair of War Studies at the British University of Warwick. He currently holds a Livium Major Research Fellowship on the Effects of Disruptive Technologies and Urban Operations. He has advised and mentored the British Army and Royal Marines since 2004, which has included several high-profile reports. In 2019, Professor King completed a trilogy on military transformation in the 21st century. The Transformation of Europe's Armed Forces, published in, by Cambridge University Press uh, in 2011, was the first of this trilogy. The Combat Soldier, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2013. And the third book of this trilogy was titled Command, the 21st Century General, published by Cambridge University Press in 2019. His latest book, Urban Warfare, in the 21st century was published by Polity Press in July 2021. It's a privilege uh, to have you with us, uh, Professor King. The floor is yours. I'm just sorry. Uh, yeah, so I hope you heard that. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm just sorry I'm not there in person. I just, my diary and calendar, it was very difficult to uh, fit in a trip to, to Doha. So I, I apologize for that. So I've been asked to talk um, about urban warfare and actually to put that in a slightly wider context of the development of warfare and the armed forces uh, over the last uh, 30 to 40 years going back. Uh, to the end of the Cold War. And so that's what I'd like to do. Now, I believe I have a few slides. I hope they might be uh, showing. Um, here we go. That's great. So here we go. Now, what I'd like to do is to um, absolutely, as the introducer so kindly said, is to talk about urban warfare and focus on that. But what I would like to do is to put that, as I say, in a wider context. So I'm going to make three points. There's three sections to my talk, and I'll talk uh, for about 30 minutes. Um, in the first section, what I want to talk about is what I call the professionalization of the armed forces, that uh, the process of professionalization uh, as a major element of military transformation, and then talk about urban warfare and then bring together a conclusion about where warfare and the armed forces uh, are going. So let's just go to the next slide, please, if that's OK. That's great. So if we look at the last 30 years, one of the very striking features is the reduction in the size of forces. Armies have become a lot smaller. And you can see the figures here for a selection of forces. Um, and almost entirely across the board, there's a couple of outliers, uh, Israel, for instance, uh, but almost entirely across the board, across the world, uh, armed forces since the 1990s, since the end of the Cold War, have become a lot smaller. Um, they've shrunk for, from about uh, to about um, a third or half of the size that they were 30 years ago. Um, and I think this, this seems mundane, but I think this is a profoundly important change. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and it's just noticeable here that some argue that in the light of uh, renewed, for instance, interstate warfare, that conscription would come back in 
and that somehow mass the mass armed forces that characterized the 20th century um would re- reappear well, we've got good evidence on this now if we look at the ukraine and the uh, the Ukraine war and look at the attempts of Ukraine and Russia to mobilize their forces, they have mobilized and they have increased recruitment and conscription and volunteer forces, but nowhere near the scale of the 20, 20th century. Um, Russia is struggling, you know, tried to raise 300,000 troops. It might get 150,000 extra. The Ukraine, Ukraine, a country of 44 million people, is is trying to aim for a force size of about 300,000. So these are large armies, but very small in comparison uh, with the 20th century. Now, the point here is that... Um, uh, these four, so the armed forces have become a lot smaller. Now, uh, the point to make is um, they are not just the same as 20th century forces, but smaller. They are not just smaller versions of 20th century forces. Overwhelmingly, the contraction of size has cre- has also involved. Uh, the uh, professionalization of these forces. So they are smaller, but they also uh, are more professional and often more competent uh, and capable and well-equipped than their 20th century uh, mass predecessor. And it's a major feature of contemporary warfare and uh, contemporary uh, 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 military uh, forces. And it's a, it has a very significant effect upon the issue of urban warfare. Let me move on. Can we move on to probably the next slide? And then let, let me leave this here. Uh, what uh, This slide, all I'm saying here is that these forces might be on, these professionalized small sources, forces might be understood as post forwarders. Let me not We can talk about that if we're interested in the questions. Let's move on to the next slide, on to urban warfare. Now, uh, as the introducer said, one of the very, very striking features of the last uh, 20 to 30 years is the rise of urban warfare. And we've seen this very strongly in Ukraine. Why has urban warfare uh, become such a dominant aspect of both interstate and indeed uh, uh, civil war of of intrastate uh, conflict. Well, if we look at the literature, there are three arguments or that have been made and two have been typically made. Two particularly have been forcefully made in all of the literature. And the first argument is demographic. The human world population has vastly urbanized in the last uh, 30 years. Now, if you look at these figures, in 1960, uh, the world population was about 3 billion, 0.5 of a billion uh, lived in cities. Uh, 2020, 2023 now, um, 7 billion of us live in cities. The the population is 7 billion, uh, 7 billion humans on the planet. Uh, 3.5 billion of us live in cities. In other words, there's as many people uh, living in cities today as they were alive just over uh, 50 years ago. And the argument is because of urbanization, massive urbanization in some cases, it's inevitable uh, that warfare will migrate to the cities. Uh, Urban areas are unavoidable. Uh, Urban areas are are often the crucible of conflicts uh, because that is uh, where political uh, disputes emerge. Uh, The cities, often cities, are the site of disaffection, alienation uh, and uh, and aggression. Uh, And so therefore, uh, uh, conflict has uh, migrated to the cities. So first reason for the urbanization of warfare is demographic. Can we just move to the next slide, please? But the second argument that you will find in the literature, both the military literature and the academic literature, is that um, is is the argument for asymmetry, namely that urban areas, densely packed urban areas, large cities have provided the perfect cover for especially insurgent forces that the city with its 
complex topography, its top complex geography, um, provides uh, uh, irregular forces, has provided irregular forces with the best way to offset uh, the advance advantages of state advanced military uh, technology. So you put these two arguments together, demography and the advantages of fighting in the city, and the literature and commentators overwhelmingly say that, um, uh, therefore, uh, urban warfare has migrated to the city and is likely to uh, uh, continue to be located in the city uh, in the future. I agree with these arguments completely, but there's a third important element which explains why urban conflict has become so prevalent in the last uh, 30 years. Let's just move to the next slide, please. Um, so the third argument, which has been missed in the um, literature, uh, but which is absolutely essential, is the issue of force densities, of the size of the armed forces, the size of armies. This has been absolutely crucial in, um, in explaining why warfare has migrated to the city. The point is this, and let's move on to the next slide. So uh, if we look at the uh, 20th century, and, and Ukraine provides a very good example of this, if we look at the 20th century and we look to the example of interstate warfare, uh, states raised very massive armies. Uh, for instance, uh, the Red Army uh, was over 8 million uh, soldiers strong. Um, uh, the other combatants produced armies uh, of millions of soldiers strong. And the point here is that these million soldier armies, these million man armies, they were predominant, almost entirely ma male armies, uh, were able to form very large fronts in the field. Um, and they, these fronts uh, crossed uh, the field and the uh, a major part of the combat force was located in the field. Why was this the case? Because the armies were so big, uh, they had to deploy over very large areas. Uh, they had to deploy over very large areas because they wanted to exploit all of their combat power. And of course, confronting a very large mass opponent, they did not want to be outflanked. So the characteristic of the uh, 20th century uh, uh, war was a war, land war was a war of fronts. That front was punctuated by cities, but the overwhelming bulk of the armed forces were located in the field. Now, just look at Ukraine. In Ukraine, in when Ukraine, the Battle of Ukraine, uh, the campaign for Ukraine in 1943, 1944, when the Red Army pushed uh, the German army, the German Wehrmacht, out of Ukraine, uh, the uh, uh, Red Army uh, consisted, the Red Army that fought the front in Ukraine, consisted of 20 armies, three to four million soldiers, and the, uh, uh, the German army, uh, about 1.5 million soldiers. Let's move on to the next uh, slide. Uh, so what they what they what occurred, and you can see it from the previous slide, is that these uh, forces deployed uh, from the north to the south of Ukraine in extremely densely held front. Move to uh, 2022 and the invasion of Ukraine uh, last February, and you'll see from this map the very different. Uh, campaign geometries at work. Russia invaded Ukraine uh, with a force of about 190,000. The actual combat element was smaller, about 150,000. Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian army was 120,000 soldiers strong, but actually the decisive combat force, the capable brigades that were capable and did most of the fighting in the first three to six months, we're about five brigades, that is about 30 to 40,000 troops. So let's just compare that. You have a theatre in uh, 1943 to 44, in which uh, there is a three million, an army of three, three million soldiers fighting an army of over one million soldiers. It generates 
a major front from the north to the south of the country. But in 2022, you have a relatively two relatively small armies, one of 150,000, one of effectively initially about 40,000, larger in total, but about 40,000. What's the result? The result is the Russian and Ukrainian forces do not have the soldiers to form a large, densely held front across the entire country. Ukrainian and Russian forces converged on key urban areas. They converged on Kyiv, um, on uh, Kharkiv, on Mariupol in that first uh, section, session of the war, the first period of the war. And why did they converge on those areas? Because in order to prosecute the campaign, the urban areas, the key objectives lay inside of urban areas. Of course, in the first Battle of Kyiv, in the Battle of Kyiv from uh, February to April uh, 2022, just a year ago, um, Kyiv was the centre of political power. Uh, uh, Putin hoped to uh, invade and take Kyiv and therefore bring the entire regime down. So it had a it was a key strategic objective. In other cases, such as... Um, smaller towns like Severodonetsk, which was fought over very heavily in the summer, this was not a strategic objective, but it was an important operational one. What we find is that uh, road uh, junctions and roads run through urban areas, railway lines run through urban areas, and therefore to prosecute the furtherance of their campaign, the Russians had to take those towns in order to be able to advance further into the Donbass, for instantly, instance. And by contrast, of course, Ukrainian forces desperately wanted to defend and hold on to those key locations. They want their, you know, successfully to Kyiv and then to Mariupol and to Severodonetsk. But note the very different dynamic of 21st century warfare, smaller, professionalized post Fordist uh, forces cannot form massive dense fronts. Therefore, they are converge on, they are driven into and onto urban areas where they're engaged in very intense fights. Let's move on a slide. And let's move on again. I'll, I, 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 let's, let's leave this slide, we'll move on to the next slide. So let me ask this question. Um, what is the character of the urban battle once forces have converged on urban areas, once, and let's let's focus on the example of Ukraine, once um, the Russian forces had converged on key urban locations in Ukraine um, and the Ukrainian forces wanted to defend them, what is, what's the key characteristic? What is the anatomy of the urban battle? Well, I'd put it to you, it has two characteristics. First, it has localized. There has been a process of localization. What we see in Ukraine and indeed in other uh, wars and wars against ISIS and the Syrian civil war and the Libyan civil war is that these smaller forces, once they've converged on key urban areas, when once they converge on these urban areas in which they have to seize key bits of infrastructure, key transport nodes, they engage in intense siege warfare, siege battles over those decisive locations. What I'd argue is, uh, the phrase that I've used is, is, we see the emergence of these inner urban micro sieges, intense fights inside urban areas for very particular objectives. And the urban battles of Ukraine war and indeed of the Syrian civil war took on this very distinctive characteristic. Once the forces had converged on the urban areas, they engaged in a series of punctuated siege actions, siege battles, sieges, for decisive key buildings, locations within the city. So 
The first feature of the 21st century urban battle um, is its extraordinary localization. The forces concentrate and condense into a very specific uh, locale, and the fighting there is and has been extraordinarily intense. And we can look at the Battle of Bakhmut, which is going on at the moment, as an example of this, an intense fight for key um, objectives around and within uh, the town and the subsequent suburbs of Bakhmut. Let's go on to the next uh, slide. Now, the urban battle fought by these smaller, profession often professionalized forces, um, which I described at the outset, has a second, almost paradoxical element. Even as it has condensed and converged onto decisive locations inside urban areas, it has simultaneously globalized outwards. The combatants and their supporters actively seek to engage, to mobilize, to recruit, uh, to inform their supporters and potential supporters in other cities across the world. And what we see is a very interesting phenomenon, a localization of the fighting to, to urban areas and inside of urban areas for particular objectives, and a transnationalization, a, uh, a, 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 an extension, extrapolation of that combat resonating out across an urban archipelago, resonating out to ethnic and political diasporas across the world, seeking uh, to attract uh, and engage them and create support from them. Now, in terms of uh, Ukraine, you can see this very clearly. So even while the Battle of Kyiv and the Battle of Severodonetsk were going on in February and March, and then in May and June of 2022, the Ukrainians were very uh, uh, cleverly and successfully seeking to um, communicate their, um, their plight and their endeavor to communities uh, across the world. And one of the most important at this point was London. Why London? Because London has been a key home for Russian uh, businessmen, uh, Russians associated with the Putin regime in often very nefarious ways. And so even while uh, the battles were raging inside of Ukrainian cities, a second front, a second battle, was taking place in London uh, with uh, Russian emigres within that city. And we'll remember that uh, the British government uh, finally sought to sanction and exclude uh, Russian mem members of the Russian uh, uh, government, associates of Putin, uh, from the financial markets and property uh, within London. So what I suggest to you is, is we see a very peculiar, very distinctive um, geometry, a very distinctive anatomy to the urban battle of the 21st century. It is extraordinarily localised. The tiny numbers of troops, these small 21st century professionalised post fordist armies uh, that we've seen emerging over the last 30 years, can no longer fight massive battles in the field, these traditional engagements of heavy arm in the field, and instead converge on urban areas. And even while they converge and fight these brutally intense battle in urban areas, they're communicating their messages and seeking to gain support, recruitment, weaponry, money, etc., political support across a global urban archipelago. And the urban fight, the urban battle of the 21st century, is both of those elements, both the localised element and the globalised element. It has two distinct faces, but which are intimately interconnected. Let me go on to the last slide. Let me just talk very briefly um, about the future of the armed forces and potentially uh, the future of warfare. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about artificial intelligence, robotics, 
and autonomous systems, and especially uh, autonomous uh, lethal weapons. Now, one of the arguments here, a strong argument in the literature, is that in the next 15 years, by 2040, uh, the armed forces and uh, warfare will have been revolutionized. Autonomous systems enabled and indeed controlled by artificial intelligence will dominate uh, the, the future battlescape. Um, and the images of is of um, uh, of, uh, of science fiction, essentially, drawing on films uh, such as Terminator produced in uh, 1984, where essentially robots, uh, artificially intelligent, intelligent robots uh, take over the battle space. Um, is this a plausible vision? Is this go is the autonomous system, uh, artificial intelligence going to take over the battle and transform urban warfare? No, in my view. In my view, um, uh, the urban battle that we see today with its distinctive localised and globalised characteristics will completely continue. But will there be changes? Will there be uh, evolutions over the next 10, 15 years? Absolutely. There have already been very substantial evolutions uh, over the last uh, 10 years. And artificial intelligence... Uh, data and artificial intelligence has become extremely important, but not in the way that many uh, commentators argue. The point here is that um, data has become a key way of um, preparing the intelligence picture of the battle phase, uh, space. So data, um, that is information held, digital computable information held on the internet, essentially, um, in all its forms, has become a key resource for advanced militaries. And the American military uh, in particular, but also the Russians a bit, the American military and the Chinese military are looking and have looked to exploit the potential of data um, as I say, information held in, in virtual reality, in the cyberspace, in the internet, in order to improve their understanding of the battle space. Essentially, data has been used, data from satellites, data from open source, data from ver a variety of sensors, of uh, infiltrations into uh, communication systems, infiltrations into mobile phone systems, etc., has enabled the US military and other militaries and will enable the other militaries to understand the battle space better and to target more precisely, uh, to identify enemies more precisely across the depth of the uh, battle space. Uh, and indeed, in Ukraine, we can see this already happening with the Ukrainian forces helped by the US. So we see absolutely data often processed by various forms of intelligent, uh, of artificial intelligence, uh, assisting the targeting and the planning uh, process. Now, the interesting point about this, I started this talk saying uh, over the last 30 years, what we've seen is the rise of a small professional military. What I'd suggest we are currently beginning to see is the rise of a revised form of military, a military that I would playfully, might playfully call an Amazonian military. What do I mean by that? The armed forces don't have I don't own the data. They don't own the sensors that they require to uh, have a better understanding of the battlefield. They don't own the expertise to process that data. And therefore, what I'd suggest we're seeing now is a very interesting development. Namely, military forces are creating close partnerships with tech companies Google, Amazon, Palantir, Anduril, Alibaba, et cetera. They're creating these close partnerships with tech companies, tech giants and tech primes, which own mass data and have the ability uh, to process them. So what I suggest we might be seeing, we are seeing, and, might, and, and is likely to become more developed over the next five to 10 years, is 
the replacement of the old, small, professionalized, um, post Fordist force of the last 30 years with a new kind of force, an Amazonian force, a force that fuses the public sector military and the private sector tech companies, uh, a kind of new military tech uh, complex. Now, this is organizationally, I think, really significant. Um, however, will it change the genuine character, the basic character of land warfare? Will it change the basic character of uh, urban conflict? In my view, no. I think that the fundamental fact of having small forces with advanced weaponry uh, drives the military into cities and defines the urban battle. I have no doubt that AI processing mass data will improve systems of targeting across the depth of the battlefield. Will it fundamentally change uh, the character of urban warfare in the next 5, 10, 15 years? I, I do not believe so. And the evidence, in fact, is in front of our eyes because if we look at the battles which have occurred in Ukraine, if we look at battles like uh, Severodonetsk, the Ukrainians, Ukrainians supported by the United States have in fact prosecuted a data-centric algorithmic warfare. And what do we see? A war that is highly sophisticated in its targeting and yet totally brutal uh, at the level of the actual street fight. Paradoxically, the most advanced forms of data science also give us a, a form of warfare at the street level, at the level of the actual fighting, at the level of the close battle, which has as much in common with ancient warfare, uh, with the destruction of Jerusalem or various other cities or, or Nineveh in, uh, in the ancient world as they do with anything uh, in the 20th century. So thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much for your insightful and uh, invaluable uh, lecture. Um, you touch on many, many points. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to sum it up a little bit. Uh, you started by saying that due to demographic, asymmetric strategy and force density, urban warfare migrated to the city. Uh, moving to the Ukraine or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you pointed to the fact that both Ukraine and Russia had small professionalized uh, armies that converge to the uh, urban areas in order to prosecute their objectives. For the Russian, the objective was to take the key cities, whereas for Ukraine was to defend them. As for the characteristic, you, um, you highlighted the uh, localization and globalization of these urban uh, battles. Um, Touching on the future of the armed forces, you said that the, these autonomous and artificial intelligence may not, or actually will not take over the, the warfare as we, we know it. But you uh, pointed to, uh, to the fact that data has a key way to advance military uh, conflicts, as is happening in Ukraine. And you, um, you mentioned the, this new concept, to me at least, development of what you call the Amazonian forces. And uh, you said that uh, this, this, uh, these forces, although uh, it's, it's quite important, may not also uh, change the urban warfare as, as we know it. So there is a lot to think about, and I'm pretty sure that there would be some interaction. Let's start with uh, the comment of um, uh, Dr. Omar. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aisha, and uh, of course, thanks to uh, Anthony for the uh, great uh, and fascinating presentation. Uh, we uh, we hope next time you uh, you are with us here, and uh, because obviously some of your works is assigned to our uh, security studies uh, students uh, in multiple courses, so uh, it would be great if you can interact with them uh, at some point. Um, so uh, my comments are uh, very brief to open up for the uh, for the Q and A uh, from the audience. Uh, 
four ones, uh, four, four points uh, specifically. One on the all of them related to the rise or the possible reduction of urban warfare, um, and one on Ukraine. So the you started by the by the ma uh, by the macro level. You know the the, the population uh, increased, the uh, uh, the urbanization increased, the connect increasing connectivity, um, the. Uh, also, David Kilcullen, I would say, and, and uh, John Spencer will add the littoralization, um, and um, and also the the geography. Um, so the geography, it's the the urban or the cement jungle in in, in, in cities, and, and that's that's very old from David Galula's uh, idea that you know it, uh, the the geography uh, makes a force equalizer of some sort. Uh, so the weaker side usually use it to 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 benefit uh, and to to cover for uh, its weakness. Um, but just on that, if you if you if you look at these macro ones and apply them to to the urban, you would you would think that perhaps most of the fighting will happen in mega cities because all of that are on steroids in mega cities, not not in small towns. But then the you know the the Rakkas, the Ramadis, the 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 Fallujahs, the the uh, the Lissachansks, the the Bakhmuts, uh, you know, are, are outnumber you know the Mosuls, uh, you know, and the and the infighting. So most of the fighting actually happen. In, in smaller towns um, uh, uh, or small or smaller cities, so I, I, is there a an explanation for for, for that? Um, the the second question has to do with: Did you find in, in your work any attempt to avoid the urban, the urban, mainly because the urban is where no one wants to fight, attacker or defender? For for the attacker, every corner, every building, every window, every door, can be a death trap. For the defender. Uh, it's uh, it, his armor, his or her armor would would be the the school where his where his son goes, the 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 the, uh, the hospital where his daughter was was born, um, you know his uncle's shop. You know the, the, this is where uh, the the hit will be take the hits will be taken there. So you know attacker and defender would like to avoid the urban. Did you find any evidence translating that preference in choosing where to fight as opposed to? Uh, taking it to to the towns, um, and then the 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 last uh, 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 point slash question has to do with Ukraine. I, I'm uh, uh, fascinating that you put it that way in terms of, uh, uh, of combat readiness of, of of brigades. So in 2014, there were about three brigades that are that were combat ready, and in the summer of 2014, that is the 95th uh, Airborne, the 93rd Mechanized Infantry and the 25th uh, air uh, assault and those were the ones who you know the 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 the, the, the counter offensive of summer 2014 that brought liberated many of the cities that were taken by russian led uh, insurgents um, happened with, uh, within by the, by these troops and within this time frame so now you you're saying it's just five brigades that are that were combat ready in 2022 so, and maybe some of the, our Ukrainian specialists in the audience can weigh in on that. What happened, in, so th these basically, um, we're, we're talking about uh, almost eight years, where is the Ukrainian uh, transformation and reforms when it comes to the armed forces? Because there were, there were many of them, but if the result is yeah. two more brigades after, combat ready brigades after, after eight years, then there's a question mark. And uh, after that, I would like to thank you again, and we open it up for the audience. Thank you. We have a question. We will take, um, let's see what, what time we have. We have about 20, 20 minutes. So uh, we have a question there, then we'll, we'll move to this lady. Anthony, thanks very much for that. Um, Hamish Breton Gordon from Magdalen College, Cambridge. Uh, I, I've got a lot of experience in the Syrian conflict, and I'd just like to perhaps add another um, element to the urban warfare. Uh, in Syria, the, uh, the target of the aggressors, the Russians and the uh, Syrian regime, were actually the civilian population. So that's why they attacked the urban areas, uh, attacked the schools, attacked the hospitals, and attacked the infrastructure uh, in order to um, bring, uh, in order so that they could prevail. And it would seem that the Russians are conducting a similar type warfare um, in Ukraine. So if the civilian population is the target in both the Syrian and the Ukraine conflict, um, is that another key reason that is driving the war into the urban areas 
uh, rather than, you know, if we were doing traditional maneuver warfare, you'd expect people to try and maneuver around those areas and uh, encircle them. Thank you. Back to you. We'll get the lady and then... Thank you. Thank you, Professor King, for, for your presentation. I have also a couple of questions. My name is Maria Zolkin. I'm a Ukrainian expert working now at the London School of Economics. Um, uh, actually, my question uh, is in support of, in order to elaborate, to make you elaborate a little bit on the question of the Dr. Omar. Omar. Um, all the fights which were happening uh, around cities or within the cities, actually, um, they were from my perspective and from my expertise, they were for political reasons rather than military logic. And that is why Russia is uh, not capable of, uh, for instance, capturing Bakhmut for nine months already. This is really small city, even in the, uh, you know, from Donbass perspective. Uh, the same story was in all the Luhansk region. But the question is, can we speak about classical urban warfare in these cases, taking into regard the fact that cities are really small, that Russia doesn't rely on urban warfare in terms of street fights and rely mainly on artillery destruction of the cities. Third factor, almost all the cities in Ukraine, starting from Luhansk region and ending with, uh, ending with the Solidar and Bakhmut in Donetsk region, they are empty in terms of pre-war population right now. For instance, Severodonetsk had 125,000 of population when Ukrainian army was fighting and still sitting in the city. There were just about 10,000 of population. The same story is, is with Bakhmut. So can we treat this as a kind of classical urban warfare when the city and buildings there actually are treated as a fortifications rather than you know the, the battlefield for classical urban warfare? Thank you for explanation. Gentlemen over Excellent. Okay, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I just have an issue with describing what happened in Syria as a civil war and comparing it with other uh, wars, I and mean, that's completely unfair. What happened in Syria is more of an intifada like what happened in Palestine, and I mean, the people had nothing to defend themselves with, and they were bombarded with you know, barrel bombs and stuff like that. So describing it as civil war is just totally unfair, I think, to the people. Be people who have nothing to defend themselves being fought by armies from Russia, from Iran, from the regime who's more of an occupying force. So that description to me is totally uh, unjust, and then maybe that's a Western view of it, but it's not a civil war. It's you know, a tyrant you know, uh, oppressing their own people. Thank you. Well noted, and uh, okay, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we'll, we'll come back for a second round of questions. Would you like me to answer the questions? Yes, that, please. That, okay, so thanks a lot. And, and as I say, I'm, I, I got to just apologize. I just, uh, it would be lovely to be in there. And I, I, and especially seeing some colleagues of mine who I recognize in the audience, um, you know, I, I, let me just express that regret that I just, I just, in terms of the calendar I had, it was just tricky. Um, look, you, these are really interesting and important questions that you've raised. Um, let me try and answer them. I, I, I mean, in the time that I've got, you, you know, when I say no answer is satisfactory, but, you know, we're, we're talking very deep discussions here. Um, uh, the, the, uh, let, let, let me go through some of them and try and to, to answer. Um, Omar, yeah, mega cities. Look, um, this is it. Uh, the mega city issue is for me is a non-issue, um, uh, in the sense that um, it, it, it's, it's a logical extension of the argument about if if urbanisation is the cause of conflict, then of course the bigger the city, the more likely the conflict is, and of course. There's various states around the world, especially, um, uh, you, you know, for instance, in in South America or, or Southeast Asia, which are running security operations in mega cities. Um, they're at a low level of conflict. We wouldn't probably we wouldn't call it war, but it's their security operations. So there are security operations ongoing in mega cities. But the fact is that w w where uh, higher intensity warfare has taken place, both both civil conflict and um, interstate conflict, there's the the, the, the urban there haven't been mega cities. Kiev is a very big city. 
3 million, but it's not a mega city normally starts about 8 million. Uh, but the point is, so how do you, you don't need mega cities. The key factor for me, as I say, um, is actually, you know, the, uh, is actually the decline of the, the reduction in armed forces starts to explain this urbanization much more, uh, much more efficiently. So th that's where I'd be on that. Um, avoiding urban, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Militaries still say, oh, we're going to try and avoid urban. Not so clear with some um, uh, some insurgent, irregular, non-state forces, um, but certainly most military forces say they want to avoid urban. And for instance, I can't find any evidence that the Ukraine armed forces had a plan to defend in the urban. It seemed to develop organically, and they became highly effective at it. So although... There is still this doctrine, military doctrine of avoiding the urban. Often events take over and uh, forces have ended up struggling for urban areas. The Ukrainian think, yeah, look, this, uh, you know, my, my evidence here is uh, there's some work come out of a couple of uh, British, uh, UK um, uh, uh, think tanks, Rusi in particular. So absolutely, the Ukrainian army in 2022 uh, was much bigger, much more, much more effective, uh, than the one in 2014. Uh, but what the claims of those think tanks, and they have close, you know, they have much closer links to the Ukrainian armed forces than I do, is that the key bits of fighting, especially around the Battle of Kyiv and the early uh, months of the post Kyiv phase, so February, March into April, May, uh, was predominantly uh, taken on by about five key brigades, which these were uh, some of the three. There were many, there were the, the armed forces as a whole, the army as a whole was about 120,000. And, and they did perform a very important role holding certain positions. But some of the key bits of combat were done by those five elements. And the other bit where the Ukrainian forces hugely, you know, hugely enabled was in the command and control architecture. I mean, this is where there was a transformation between 2014 and 2022, um, and that was very significantly as a result of uh, US uh, and, and UK uh, assistance. So we're not talking the same kind of force. Um, Hamish Brent Gordon from my old alma mater. Yeah, um, so this is a really interesting point, yeah. Um, so civilians have been targeted, and of course, where do civilians live? They live in urban areas. Um, I might say your 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 question has a couple of you know there's a couple quite a lot of subtlety to your question. Um, let me give a slightly crude answer, and hopefully maybe we could take up this 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 conversation later. But what I'd suggest it it's sometimes worth thinking about the difference between the deeper battle and the closer battle. So without question, I completely agree with you, both the uh, Syrian regime, Assad's regime, and um, uh, and Putin have um, targeted civilians in, in the deep as a sort of terroristic, um, a coercive uh, system, absolutely. Um, and that, because the civilians are located, they live in urban areas, that has, of course, taken place in urban areas. Um, what I'd suggest is that the close, the close military fight has also uh, uh, taken place uh, in, in in urban areas. So on both on both accounts, because if we go back to the 20th century, of course, civilians were being once strategic bombing started, civilians were being massively targeted in urban areas. But the land warfare predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly uh, took place uh, in the field where mass armies were deployed. And now you have both the close fight of the, of the military and the coercion of the civilian population uh, occurs in, 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 the, in urban areas. Uh, Maria's point, um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, I mean, you've made some obviously, you know, highly subtle uh, points. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, for sure. Um, once, um, uh, yeah, the, so there's two points you, you made. The political point about cities, yeah. Many many of the cities that Russia tried to say has a political dimension. Kiev is a strategic political 
uh, 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 objective from the outset. And Bakhmut also has taken on this kind of political significance, uh, not least because there seems to be some uh, 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 Prigozhin at Wagner is using it to sort of leverage uh, political profile in Moscow, for sure. So even small um, urban objectives can be invested with potentially significant political importance. But what I'd suggest in those smaller towns like Severodonetsk, um, uh, Rabizne, uh, 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 and Bakhmut, is there is a, the focus is more operational and tactical, namely in order for the Russians to prosecute their invasion, pr prosecute their aggression, they have to actually have this have have certain bridges. They have to have road junctions. They have to have the, the railheads. So therefore, they they need to take those urban areas and have focused on them. And this leads to your second point about absolutely the the urban fighting has been completely brutal. The Russian technique has been mass bombardment, and of course, the civilian populations have left. And so you've been left with these. Um, Essentially, as you use the word fortified, absolutely. It's they're like early medieval, uh, early modern medieval or ancient fortresses, which have, the civilian population have basically evacuated them, and they've become fortresses being fought over by military forces. I mean, for me, that is absolutely definitive urban warfare. Um, I'm happy if other people want to define it in a different way, but. You know, in an interstate warfare, even in a high intensity um, uh, civil conflict, um, this for me, the that sort of fighting in an in an urbanized area, even as the civilian population left, is understood. It should be understood as urban warfare. But I mean, I completely take your point. Final point: uh, civil war. Look, I, I just say this. I don't mean that in any moral way, and I I I mean civil war merely to to identify a conflict between. Um, political protests in a country, an indigenous conflict, which it reaches a level of intensity. Uh, I don't have any moral, I mean, my own moral is obviously in support of Syrian protest groups, not in support of Assad. Uh, so I don't use that term in any moralizing way at all. And, and you know, I, I you know, I, I'd absolutely want to emphasize that. Um, so those are my answers to those very interesting questions. They're inadequate Thank you. answers, but, but, but answers. Thank you for the clarification. We'll take a second round. We have about um, less than 10 minutes. So uh, Dr. Ray Rixman. Uh, hello, Anthony. Terrific, terrific presentation. This is uh, Rex Bryan from McGill University. And I had two issues I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on. You mentioned uh, avoid the urban. I mean, the urban terrain is historically associated with grueling and, and destructive warfare. But I wonder if we're at a, with regard to peer armies, not, not, not asymmetric warfare, I wonder whether we're at the point where warfare in more open areas has become so destructive because of the increased accuracy of artillery, uh, the, the, the speeding of the, the sensor to shooter loop, I mean, our ISR capabilities, that in fact attrition rates will prove to be lower in urban areas than they are in more open terrain. Um, certainly in, in Ukraine, the proportion of casualties due to artillery actually seems to be even slightly higher than the numbers for World War II. I think the Ukrainian numbers were very uncertain of, but it was about two-thirds casualties by artillery in World War II. It seems to be as high as 80% in Ukraine, which might mean it's safer to, fire, to, to fight in the city because the performance of ISR platforms is degraded and because the performance of artillery, the lethality of, of artillery is degraded. So I wonder whether in the future it will be safer to fight in an urban area than in an open area, because open areas have become more and more and more lethal. Second thing I wanted you to, to comment on, you mentioned the importance of command and control. It seems to me morale and motivation is always important in warfare. It is particularly important in urban warfare because it's easy not to fight, because you can simply hunker down in a building and not, not cross the street. Um, NCO quality, junior officer quality becomes particularly important when you're in those fragmented small units fighting basement by basement or house by house. And so I wonder whether 
the inevitability of more and more urban fighting highlights the importance not just of robust command and, command and control, but of morale, motivation, small unit leadership, and so forth. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. And thank you very much, Professor. Uh, there was very insightful presentation and many touch regarding the uh, new domains of the uh, also uh, warfare in 21st century. And I'm going with that, um, having in mind uh, this, what you mentioned about this warfare, uh, urban warfare in Syria and Ukraine, could you please present some key points regarding lessons learning? What we can improve re regarding operation, security operation, how you will better conduct security operation in the urban zone? And this is the first question. The second question, as we notice, uh, we are in kind of hybrid environment, particular regarding the war, carrying war, wagging the war. In your view, the cyber warfare, cyber attack has any challenge or bring any challenge to how conduct the operation in urban environment? Thank you. Thank you. We take the last question. Thank you very much for this terrific uh, talk, uh, um, Professor King. You mentioned that the um, that the the army has got smaller uh, in the last thirty years, and this forced the urbanization of land uh, warfare. Have armies adapted to this shift in terms of training, doctrine, and equipment? Thank you. Thank you. We'd appreciate, uh, Professor King, if you can answer these questions in thanks a lot. five minutes. Th thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Well, look, uh, once again, a uh, superb set of questions and, and makes me feel even worse I'm not there because obviously the levels of discussion are going to be um, so high. Um, yeah, Rex. Um, yeah, in, 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 interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. So this is this is an interesting this is an interesting point uh, um, for me. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true that the very fact that um, the targeting is so lethal. And I mean, you know, you've seen that really strongly in Ukraine. Uh, I mean, the, the Ukrainian targeting of the Russians has been remarkable. This, you know, they've killed over 20 generals in, in their command posts. They've destroyed with accuracy um, the various logistic hubs, artillery, uh, you know, ammunition dumps, etc. cetera. Um, so, so absolutely, in the open, suddenly the open with where you have satellite and open source and various other forms of electromagnetic warfare, it's very difficult to hide um, from being struck. It's 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 so at that that point, um, the urban environment with its complexity, with its subterranean aspects, uh, with the opportunity to camouflage, etc., uh, represents. A, a clear advantage. And the point about urban as well is um, it, it, even if one is struck, it is, it, it is, it, it is uh, because the structures already in, exist, it's easier to protect oneself from, uh, from artillery fire. And the Ukrainian forces have been, uh, I mean, remar you know, remarkably resilient in terms of that. Uh, think of something like the Battle of uh, Mariupol with the extraordinary stand at the Avastol uh, 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 steelworks. So completely agreed that you know, there's a there's an interesting thing, and the military still aren't. Even though when they engage in operations, they kind of organically recognise this at the official level. They're still often not happy about urban. They don't they don't see urban as as the defensive advantage. And some of this is a hangover of the 20th century, because if urban is so important defensively, as the Ukraine the Ukrainian force have shown so brilliantly. Um, it means that there's a flip in terms of warfare, uh, because what, in contrast to the 20th century, where manoeuvre and attack was always regarded as the act, as the primary effort, um, the powers of defence are now being shown to be uh, to, to, to be important. So absolutely, um, C2, yeah, look, 
Um, I'd love to talk more with you about this. Um, yeah, completely agreed. Uh, and this is again where the Ukrainians have been hugely um, successful. Is um, although an urban battle is just about small units, um, without determined, skilled fighters at company, you know, unit uh, uh, unit company and unit level, it's very difficult to prosecute to prosecute those operations. And and the difference, you know, many commentators have observed the difference between the the, the Ukrainian and Russian forces has been at that level. And I, I completely concur with that. So there is demand for a high level of you know, this goes back to my first point of professionalized forces uh, to exploit and leverage in that urban area. Uh, second point, le lessons learned. Um, uh, well, in a way, what I've, what, I, what I've just said, I mean, there are many lessons to learn. It depends also which level. Um, at, the, at, the, at the lowest level, um, uh, 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 um, the importance, in, especially in terms of high, inten high intensity, the importance of defensive operations and preparing to fortify yourself from strike, a critical one. At the higher level, one of the um, lessons which is learned, which is being learned, is the capability of using urban fortresses as um, anchors from which to strike the enemy in the deep, which actually early modern generals fighting from systems of fortresses and seeking to attrit enemy as they approach would be very familiar with. So absolutely at the lower level, there's these lessons and at the higher level, uh, some important things. Issue of cyber warfare. Really, this is a really critical issue. Um, and I'm not, the answer I'm going to give is going to be very, very partial. One of the things Ukraine war has shown, uh, and I completely agree with Tom Ridd's point that cyber warfare is not really a thing. Um, so the use of cyber to to um, you know to mount cyber sabotage, um, uh, cyber espionage, or cyber subversion, those are important things. I .e. using the internet and virtual cyber systems uh, for those purposes. They, they're real. Um, in terms of urban warfare, in terms of Ukraine, a couple of interesting things. One, cyber attacks, as in cyber sabotage, they're really important. And the Russians tried a number of them in the early on, early on in the war, and a couple of them seem to have been successful until Microsoft um, came in and, 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 and hardened their um, cyber system. But cyber attacks work on a longer wavelength than high intensity fighting and high intensity urban warfare. And I think what most commentators have said has been interesting is that cyber attacks have been less significant in Ukraine, partly as a result of fortification of systems, uh, than was expected. But there's another dimension of cyber which has been completely uh, crucial, and I use cyber in a very generic general term here, and that's been in targeting. I mentioned it before, is that um, the Ukrainian targeting assisted assisted by the US, a lot of that has been harvesting open source or encrypted or you know de-encrypting encrypted um, cyber messaging, and that's been absolutely crucial. So urban warfare is this brutal street fight but it also absolutely is taking place simultaneously uh, in the in the cyber domain uh, in, in various really interesting ways. And for me, it has uh, amplified this strange character of contemporary urban warfare, both incredibly localised and transnationalised, globalised at the same time. It's a strange thing. Final point. Um, One minute, I've got please. Some more. Have, they, have they adapted? And the answer is to that, yes. So let me stop there and and not go not go on. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I mean, you you still have one minute to answer the last question. Oh, okay. Um, ha have armies adapted? Well, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes um, formally, and and often informally. I mean, one of the things I said I mentioned it before. Um, and and there's some Ukrainians in the audience. They may know the answer better than me. But my interpretation of that early phase of the war, the defense of Kiev, was uh, the but Ukrainian forces had anticipated, not unreasonably, in fact, totally reasonably, that the Russians would invade from the east and seek to take Luhansk and Donbass. And they were surprised by the drive on Kyiv and were then forced to move some of their best forces back 
to defend Kiev and did so successfully, and I might say brilliantly. Um, and so they themselves adapted, and I think have adapted a highly sophisticated system, operational system of urbanized defense, defense from urban uh, strong points. So absolutely, um, I think armies have adapted um, and they will adapt uh, in the ne- you know in the in the face of these these operations and and you know Western forces themselves are thinking seriously uh, about the urban as an, as a key environment. So yeah, I mean it's a it's a really great point, uh, and I think the answer to that is yes. Well, uh, please join me in thanking again uh, Professor King for your great you. contribution, uh, and thank you all. Uh, we'll have. A- very short um, break, coffee break, and I will come back for the sixth panel. Thank you.